The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 217. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Before we get started today, I just wanted to uh, to recommend again to, to connect with me on Twitter so that we can... Uh, listen to the, the the books and the authors that you would love to hear from most. So hit me up and, and let us know. So today we have Lior Zoreff, author of Mind Sharing, The Art of Crowdsourcing Everything. I'm excited for you guys to be able to, to listen to this because I, we haven't really covered this topic just yet or covered uh, many books that discuss this topic. Um, so let's bring on Lior. Welcome, Lior, and thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Thank you very much. It's great being here. Before we take a deep dive into mind sharing, we take just a moment to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you uh, personally. Sure. I'm 44 years old, married with three kids, uh, a geek. So the most important thing that I was obsessed with was uh, technology early on. Uh, so I began to uh, be a computer scientist and study com- computer programming. Uh, and then after that, I uh, started to work in Microsoft. And I was there for 14 years. And most of my career was in marketing, which was a coincidence, but I fell in love with marketing. And then as I turned into um, almost becoming uh, 40, I had my midlife crisis. And I thought to myself, what do I want to do next with my life? And I decided to retire from Microsoft and started uh, my PhD. And my research is in the area of crowdsourcing and wisdom of crowds, which is also the topic of my book. So what I do in the last few years is I uh, consult to brands and startups that are using crowdsourcing as a strategic tool uh, to innovate and to do things uh, better. Uh, And I was fortunate uh, to be speaking at TED a few years ago, and this opened the door for the opportunity to write a book. Um, so this is basically what I do. I'm very enth- enthusiastic about the power of uh, social networks, especially when we use them differently uh, in order to uh, do crowdsourcing. And I guess that we'll talk about it uh, later. Absolutely. And, and thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm excited to jump into this. We haven't covered this topic uh, very much in the last you know, 216 episodes, so I'd love to get more information. Uh, so let's jump right into your book. Mind sharing, the art of crowdsourcing everything, which was mm-hmm. uh, well, actually hasn't been made available just yet as of us recording this. But is the date April 28th here in the States? Yeah, it's just a few days ahead of uh, right now that we're recording this. Excellent. Well, very good. Well, this this recording will come out just a couple of days after then uh, that, that your book actually launches. So that'll be perfect timing. And uh, Leo, we're going to move quickly. But here are the sure. top questions that our listener would love to get answered before uh, before they purchase your book. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing Mind Sharing? So the inspiration is a story I heard a few years ago about Deborah. She lives in New York. And at that time, her, her four-year-old son, Leo, had fever and rush. So she went to the doctor and the doctor checked him and told her that it's probably a strep. We all know that. So she went out out of the doctor and she had a bad feeling about it. So she used her iPhone and took a picture of her son's face and posted it on Facebook. And she wrote, this is my son. He has fever and rush. The doctor says it's probably a virus. What do you think? And after an hour, she went back to her phone and she saw many messages. Three of them are people who told her that her son might have a fatal and very rare illness called Kawasaki disease that can kill him. So she took him immediately to the hospital and and she asked them, can you please check if he has Kawasaki disease? They checked it and they found that this is what he had and started treatment immediately and saved his life. And when I heard this story, I thought to myself, this is strange. I can understand how the doctor couldn't diagnose it because it's a very rare illness. But her Facebook friends are diagnosing and helping to save her son's life. This is strange. And this is when I started to do all the research uh, in my PhD and then started to write the book about the power of big crowds 
not just using social networks, also using the internet. Big crowds can become very smart, not only in helping save um, a child's life, it can help us think better, make better decisions. And uh, so after uh, hearing this story, I went into the journey in the last uh, three years of writing Mind Sharing. That is a fantastic story. I mean, again, just the, the power of, uh, of, of the network. So thank you for sharing that right off the bat. And, and now we're going to ask you, there's so many books that come out on a daily basis. So what makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? So the last uh, book that covered the same uh, area is called Wisdom of Crowds. It was published uh, in 2004. And it's an amazing book which describes this phenomenon in which, in some cases, crowds could be very smart. Um, we all know Wikipedia. For, it's, it's a great example of wisdom of crowds. But since that book, uh, social net networks started to become so popular and there isn't any, any book, to best of my knowledge, which explores what's happening in this area um, last, uh, I think it was about six months ago, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook wrote something very interesting, interesting when he celebrated Facebook's 10th anniversary. He said that in the last decade, social networks uh, were used in order to share moments. And he thinks that in the next decade, maybe social networks will help us, will help us solve problems. So my book is tapping into this specific area on how crowdsourcing and social networks can help us solve problems, can help us think better because we make many mistakes. And you probably know uh, Dan Ariely's work about how people are irrational and make so many mistakes. So when we go to a big crowd, maybe we can solve some of those uh, problems and become almost experts in any area. So uh, I think that, uh, of, and from the early reviews I hear, which, has, which are uh, very uh, positive, uh, from what I hear from others is that probably now it's the perfect timing for a book that might give us a different perspective on how to use technology and how to use social networks in order to tap into the collective wisdom of big crowds. Excellent. Leo, this next question is a little bit different because I'm asking, how would you suggest the reader engage with your book? Is this a book that you wrote that they can jump in and jump out based on information they need at that moment? Or did you really design it to be read from front to back? I think that they can jump. I recommend, first of all, read the introduction. I think that this will give you a great overview about what's in the book. And the book is divided into four parts, and I think that each and every one uh, you can jump in. So there is a part which is more how-to. So if I want to use crowdsourcing in my business or in my personal life, what exactly do I need to do? Some people are more interested to see what is the potential and how it's disrupting many industries, which is another chapter. Others would like to see how they can help in their own personal life. And there's also the last part, which is more about um, making dreams come true. And I know that many uh, listeners to this podcast are entrepreneurs, and each entrepreneur has a dream and he wants to change the world. So make sure you don't miss the last part, which is about how you can use crowdsourcing in order to make your dream or your startup from an idea to reality. Excellent. So Leo, we're to my favorite part of the interview. And this is where I'm going to ask you to really take the listener, the future reader, and, and give them a deep dive. Take them through and give them a great idea of what your book is all about. Will you take the next five to eight minutes and do that? Sure. I think that maybe I'll tell you a short story about the different parts of the book. So let me start by how crowdsourcing can help anyone in their own career. It could be a startup, it could be a business, it could be a big organizations, organization. So I, I heard about a guy called Tamir, and he is trying to take a uh, patents from the academia and uh, sell them to big organizations. This is what he do. And in the past, he was spending about one year in order to take a patent, do research about the industry, then try to map the industry, try to get to the relevant contact persons, try to send them an email or find their email. And the whole process took him about a year. Then he told me that he's using 
or he's crowdsourcing in LinkedIn in a very unique way. So what he's doing is mapping specific groups within LinkedIn, and there are groups of professionals in different professions. So he goes into one of those groups, and he just shares and, and asks a question. He says, this is the pattern I had. And he told me about one pattern, which is about smart airplane chairs. And as a geek, when I heard that, I thought to myself, wow, this is cool. I, I started to imagine a chair that can order my ticket flights, that can make me go to sleep. And then he stopped me and told me, Leo, it's completely different. It's a chair that will save your life because many people uh, who go on, on an airplane, uh, they get what they call now uh, the coach syndrome, which is a, it's called the DVT. It's something that when the blood is not uh, going uh, correctly in your body, uh, it kills people. So uh, there was a professor who invented a pattern that can uh, avoid that. And this is the, the smart chair that you can sit on even in coach and make sure you, you, you don't get this uh, uh, sy syndrome. So he went to one of the LinkedIn groups, posted a question, and he described a pattern. And just after 24 hours, the group of professionals in this uh, LinkedIn group mapped the whole industry and told him who are the organizations, who are the contact persons. They even told him that next month, there is a big conference on airplane seats in Germany. So he went to this conference and he was actually completing a one year job in just 24 hours. And this is, this can be relevant to many entrepreneurs when they are inventing something and trying to understand what is the business, what is the business landscape. And instead, or in addition for the traditional research, uh, crowdsourcing is a way to go into very big groups of professionals and just share with them uh, what you do, what is the area, and get their collective uh, understanding or advice about what you need to do. So this was the first story. It's more about, um, about your business or your career. And in the first part of the book, I give many more examples. Um, then there's a part about how we can use crowdsourcing in our in our personal lives. And let me see which story uh, might be engaging. I think that the story about, um, yes, the, I think it's about health, about medicine, which is one of the chapters. And there's a, 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 a very interesting startup called CrowdMed. Crowd, you can check it out at crowdmed.com. And this is a startup who's using crowdsourcing to solve medical mysteries. So um, the founder, Jared, which I interview in the book, uh, a few years ago, his sister had a very rare illness. Um, it was something that for years they couldn't diagnose. And as I told you in the beginning, the story about Deborah, she used Facebook. Now, Jared, he developed a startup which has a methodology of using crowdsourcing in a very unique way. So people come to this website when they have very um, serious diseases, sometimes very rare types of cancer. Those are people who go from doctor to doctor for years and, and they don't get a diagnosis. So in this startup, you uh, people go and publish all the, all their medical history, everything, and they have a group of fifteen thousand people who call themselves medical detectives, MDs, but medical detectives, not doctors, and they have a game on who is going to make the perfect diagnosis, and they bet on several diagnoses, and at the end, in using a, a one methodology of uh, crowdsourcing, they are um, going back to this person and tell him, this is the crowd diagnosis. And they have more than 90% success in diagnosing um, very fatal and rare illnesses. So I tell you about it because many entrepreneurs are trying to think how they can solve big problems, CrowdMed were using a big crowd of enthusiastic people in order to solve, solve a big problem. And, uh, and I know that uh, I, I, when I'm invited to startups, in many cases, uh, what I now start hearing that they are turning to their consumers and giving them an active role in the thinking process. So they are using crowdsourcing to make enthusiastic consumers a digital advisory board 
for the startup. Because if you have a product and you have people who are enthusiastic about it, I suggest not just wait until the product is done and then you offer it to consumers, but get them involved early on and ask for their ideas and use crowdsourcing in order to get strategic advice on what to do when you have dilemma on uh, on things you have uh, on, on on your startup. So um, in 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 uh, health, uh, there is also a very good lesson about uh, entrepreneurship and using crowdsourcing. Uh, there is another chapter with a part, as I told you in the beginning, about how to. Uh, we don't have enough time, but I'll just tell you that it's not rocket science. It's basically uh, going to places where there are big crowds of people. It could be either um, your own social network, if you have enough friends or followers. It could be uh, another website, and there are many websites uh, for those who don't know Quora. I highly recommend check it out, Quora.com. There are millions of people there who are enthusiastic about asking and answering questions. And, and in the book, I give many um, advice, uh, much advice about what exactly you need to do, how to ask question, questions, how to understand what is the collective intelligence. Um, and the last part, and this is my, my I admit, this is my favorite, favorite part because um, it's about making dreams come true. And for me, it all started a few years ago when I started my PhD. I told a friend of mine that I have a dream of maybe one day I'll present my research on the TED stage. And then my dear friend was laughing at me and he told me that I have a better chance of winning the lottery than being invited to TED. But then my Facebook friends saw that and something amazing happened they decided to make my dream come true. And from being just a crowdsourcing researcher, I found that my personal crowd of friends and followers are making my dream come true. And they told me what I need to do. They gave me almost any day an advice on what to do. One of my friends also told me that there are auditions for TED. So I went on an audition and I got accepted. And they then I went back to my friends and told me, hey, do you remember this dream? It's, it's going to become reality. Why don't we create my talk together? And I created the first crowdsource talk that was created by, by crowdsourcing. And this is the same thing that happened with the book. Uh, I didn't write it alone. Actually, the thank you list at the end of the book, I think, is the longest ever. The book was written by thousands of people in a crowdsourcing effort. So everything you see there, the stories, the ideas, even the cover, everything was created using thousands of people who were engaged in the process of creating a book. Um, so that's the last part. And then I tell inspiring stories about other people who use the power of crowdsourcing to make their dreams come true. So uh, I hope this gave you a sense about uh, different aspects uh, in the book. Uh, and at the very end, uh, I share my um, my prediction maybe about the future of crowdsourcing and how it can, it can change humanity. But this is all uh, for the long term. So that's it. That was extremely helpful. I think you did a great job of, of breaking down your book. And there's a ton of content um, and, and context to go along with it. And then this, this next question is to help us break it down even one more step further. And we're asking you, Lior, and this, and this is your personal opinion, if a reader can only take away one thing out of your entire book, one concept or principle uh, or an action item, what would you personally want that to be? I would say that we are stronger than me. What does it mean? It means that although we tend to think about problems alone or get the advice of a few selected others, when you think with a big crowd, you can upgrade. It's, it's basically as if you are upgrading your brain. So inside our brain, we have two parts. It's like dual core for geeks like me. But what if I tell you that you can upgrade your brain, not just for two cores, but maybe 50, maybe 500 or 5,000 cores. So my main um, message or concept is that there is another way 
in order to solve big problems. And it is by going to big crowds and asking questions. I suggest for someone who wants to try this out to just give it a try with a simple question. Nothing too complex. Probably some of you try to ask a recommendation about a restaurant or what to do, to do on a trip. Try to go to the next level and, and, and share a dilemma you have and ask your, it could be your friends or on a different platform, and then go from there. I promise that uh, if you will try to do that, um, you might get addicted because you will see that in almost Every decision. I don't know what it means to fail when I'm make, making decisions using the power of crowds. So this is why it, it could become uh, a bit addictive, but I think in a good sense, in a sense that we are not expert on anything. And if we can start becoming as good as experts, well, I think it's a good thing for everyone. Excellent. And you said something quote worthy right there in the beginning, which is we are stronger yeah. than me. Um, yeah. And th- that's our next question. Do you have a favorite quote from your book? Something that you wrote that you feel like will really resonate with the audience? Mm-hmm. And will you take a second to explain what it means to you? Yeah, so um, let me give you another quote. And before that, I must say that all, almost all the quotes in the book are not mine. Even the book name, Mind Sharing, is not my idea. As I told you, everything was done uh by using crowdsourcing. And a few days ago, actually just yesterday, I gave one of the first copies of the book um, to the woman who suggested the name Mind Sharing. And so let me give you another quote from the book, uh, uh, which was also suggested by by someone in the process. Uh, We all know the phrase, great minds think alike. So someone suggested that instead of just saying that, we should add another sentence. So great minds think alike, but clever minds think together. <laughs> that, that's awesome. That's extremely powerful. And we're going we're gonna to put that in the show notes at the elpodcast.com so people can go back and reflect a little bit more on that. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. And, and this next question, it's our last one. And we're going to step away from your book for a moment and actually move towards a, a recommendation. So what okay. is a book that you could recommend to, to our listener based on the way that it's impacted your life, created a, a lifestyle or a paradigm shift? And again, this question, it doesn't have to be a business book or a fiction or nonfiction. It's, it's completely up to you. But we're really looking for the one recommendation. The book that changed my life is probably um, Wisdom of Crowds by Sorvitsky. Um, I mentioned it before. Uh, it's a book which describes what is this phenomenon which we call Wisdom of Crowds. But with your permission, I want to recommend another book which I I read, read just recently. So it didn't change my life yet, but I was fascinated Um, by this book, and I can recommend it very highly. Uh, The book is called The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. So she's um, a musician. I met her uh, at TED, and she's actually giving another perspective on crowdsourcing. Uh, And and her, her area is how to ask, how to ask people for help how to get help and get love from people. And she uh, she had one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns for music ever. And I know that many entrepreneurs are very interested in crowdfunding. So I think that this book um, can give us and inspire us on use crowdsourcing uh, and, and tap into this notion of how how you need to ask other people for their help. So the the art of asking by Amanda Palmer is my recommendation. Perfect. And thank you for throwing that second one in there. And and Lior, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our, our listener to get more information on you and your book, Mind Sharing? Sure. I recommend you go to mindsharing.info slash VIP. And then you can get a complete list of crowdsourcing resources in almost any industry. Uh, So mindsharing.info slash VIP. Excellent. Well, Lior, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your book with us today. Thank you, Wade. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks again for listening in today. 
If you'd like more information on Leor or his book, Mindsharing, check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.